Welcome to the Vision for Life podcast, an ongoing conversation between the pastors of Fellowship Denver and the church at large. Each week, we respond to and discuss a subject that you've requested, questions about life, faith, the Bible, and how to follow Jesus as we go about our daily lives. I'm Autumn, host of the Vision for Life podcast. The basis for everything we discuss on this podcast is God's revelation of himself to us. God's revelation surrounds us. His revelation of himself brings wisdom and clarity to those who lack the ability to see. It provides us with a unique spiritual light, which allows us to see things that we couldn't previously, unaided by God's word and by God's spirit. I'm joined today by Hunter and by Dave and Renee Moreland. I'm going to give them all a chance now to say hello. Hi, Autumn. How's it going? Good. Good to be back with oh, you. Oh, I, I have a quick quick question. Yes. Uh, how's your fantasy football team doing today? Well, your fantasy football team uh, made some poor decisions at wide receiver, it looks like. And so uh, we will talk offline about how you can do better next week. Okay. Thanks. Dave? Autumn, thanks for having us today. I don't, have a, I don't have a fantasy football team. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's a relief, actually. I'm really glad that we don't have to discuss your fantasy football team. Renee, welcome. Hi. Thanks for having us. Um, we actually did have a fantasy football league in previous years, but it died with COVID. So I have no fantasy football information either, sadly. Fantasy football, among other things, falling yep. to COVID. Casualty of COVID, but... We're happy to be here. Thanks for having us. We're glad to have you guys join us today. Right now we have a class going on that is on the topic of politics. So Vision for Life has two expressions, this podcast and a class. And the classes are also available on the podcast feed. So you can listen to those along with these episodes. And the the things we're addressing in the podcast last week and this week align with what we're discussing within the politics series. So Hunter, I'd love for you to frame up our conversation today, help us understand how our conversation expands our understanding of what we're also discussing in the classes. One of my hopes for the class is to elevate the conversation that we have inside the church about po- political matters and to allow room for constructive, hopefully, disagreement between followers of Christ so that we can sharpen each other. And the way I'm trying to do that is to show that God's Word points us in certain directions with politically. It uh, points us in certain directions with, with how we should think about what is good for our world. And in some ways, it, it, re- it specifically reveals God's will for what we should and shouldn't do. And then how we take that and apply it to our particular political moment, the decisions that we have to make right now in 2020 in a specific context that we live in, that requires what Scripture calls wisdom. And wisdom is the capacity to apply God's revelation to specific circumstances. And in doing that, um, I'm intentionally allowing that Christians can uh, have different wisdom perspectives and land in some different places, and and I'm hoping to help us navigate that in a way that elevates the conversation and preserves the unity of the body of Christ around the, around the political matters that we really are united on, which is the Lordship of Jesus under His body and His blood broken and shed for us. Hmm. And we've invited Dave and Renee to join us today as an example of how they're doing that, how they're asking how that wisdom affects how they're navigating politics as followers of Jesus. And for Dave, how that affects how he shepherds and leads our church. That's right. One of the things I'm really uh, excited about with these podcast conversations is we're hoping to model some of this conversation. And we got to do that last week with Blythe and Jill uh, talking about how uh, politics impacts their work in, in a specifically political arena. You, you might have even picked up one as a Republican and one as a Democrat. So it was fun to, to see their different perspectives. And, and uh, today I thought I will invite my friends, one who's a Republican and one is a Democrat. It's <laughs> <laughs> <is> not true. <laughs> Inaccurate. <laughs> Just trying to stir the pot a little bit. Elevate the conversation, if you will. Mm-hmm. Elevate the conversation. We'll let you guess who is who. <laughs> um, 
for many of us entering this, uh, addressing this question, asking how can we navigate politics as a follower of Jesus um, is is loaded because we all have been shaped a particular way in terms of our religious education, our upbringing. And many times we find that that overlaps with our political education, the way that we were taught or informed religiously and politically often were intertwined. I know that was the case in my life as a child. The two definitely overlapped and were interpreted one via the other. And sometimes uh, it was a question of whether faith was interpreted via political understanding or the other way around, whether politics were interpreted via a particular religious understanding. So I would like to hear from both of you today, Dave and Renee. First of all, what is your religious story or your religious education? What was that environment like for you as you were being formed and shaped when you were younger? And what is your political story? Do the two overlap? And then how do, do those stories affect you now as you're engaging in both faith and politics as adults living in Denver? Dave, would you take that question first? Sure. Great question. My religious story goes something along the lines of I was raised in a good church um, in Oklahoma City. My dad was the pastor, and they, they both— exhibited a, a faith that was genuine to me so that wasn't a scenario where they were a certain way in public and and different in private they were both are both people of integrity so um, I came to faith early in life and um, came to understand who Jesus was through the ministry of that church and that uh, profoundly shaped and directed me for uh, for in, until now for the remainder of well into my adult years. So um, politically, I remember some of my earliest memories of politics is actually praying for presidents in church and. I remember praying for Bill Clinton in our church, and at the time, that felt pretty radical to do because uh, our church was conservative, but we prayed explicitly for a Democratic pre president, and that was really important for my dad to do. And uh, and I also remember we were involved in various... I remember as a small child, I was a part of a pro-life um we were picketing uh, something. I don't remember what, um, but we had pro-life. Uh, we were along a street, and I had a pro-life um, uh, sign up. And I it was the first time I ever remember being flipped off before. So I just assumed growing up that everyone was pro-life. I would have imagined you got in flip, getting flipped off a lot as a kid, but it turned out. Yeah, that no, was just that time. was the first one. That was the first one. And then <laughs> maybe I set a trend after that. <laughs> And uh, and then I remember my dad advocating for some sort of um, anti-pornography legislation and seeing him on the news. So um, as a pastor, and so it was pretty intertwined. It didn't feel growing up particularly partisan in that Democrats were bad and Republicans were good necessarily, but it was it was definitely intertwined. Renee, how about you? Similar to Dave, I had a really positive experience with church and a religious upbringing, my church experience. Um, I came to faith really young in a church that loved me and nurtured me and invested in me really well. It was a small community. Um, I had a great youth pastor, shout out Mike Duncan if you're listening, um, who discipled me and believed in me. And, um, and I don't remember, um, I think in retrospect, there was, the tradition was, had some rigidity and some legalism that, um, I really wasn't aware of at the time, but I don't really remember any political events. And it was a, it was a small farming community. So I don't, there were, there were no marches, there were no rallies. There was, 
no advocating for anti-pornography legislation. So I don't, I don't really remember political events associated with the church. In contrast to that, my home was very um, political. I'm from a family of six kids, and my dad was an active in the local political community. And so dinners growing up were very argumentative. I mean, respectful dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I learned to talk over everyone because that was the only place to get a word in edgewise. Elevate the conversation <laughs> means means talk louder. Yeah, Elevate right. your voice. That's right. Um with a dad who was, who I don't think has ever voted for a Republican in his life, and a mom who has never voted for a Democrat in her life. So it was a really lively, um, not angry, but just a interesting way to hash out issues, but pr pretty separate from the church. Hmm. It was more from a, from a civil standpoint or from a community standpoint. So I think I grew up with this really positive, exciting, invigorating view of, of politics and didn't really, I don't think there was a lot of overlap with faith and politics at that point. It seemed very practical. Mm -hmm. the, the discussions were very practical. They didn't have a lot of moral writers on them. It was just like, yeah, we need a new sign at the high school. Like, what should we do? And what should, how should we vote that way? Well, and, it sounds like you're saying the politics were more local. Is that true? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and, you know, it was before the age of the Internet, and I, I don't know if I was super aware of what was happening nationally and globally. You know, you're more isolated in, in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Politics in that era were less affected at the local level by national issues, where many people observe that one of the things that's happened is that almost all politics has become national. Right. Where, right. where the, even right. at a local level, we're, we're taking sides according to where we stand on national, national issues. Yeah. issues. Yeah, I think that's new. All right, which was definitely something I wasn't aware of at the time. Mm. Um, when, when, and I think as I got into college... I became more aware of sort of if you're a Christian. And then actually when we were in Dallas, I think that became a, a really strong distinction of, of Christians are supposed to be on this side or supposed to be on that side. And I kind of started to feel those enmesh together. Um, and then we moved to England after we graduated from seminary. And again, it was a, this great experience of the political systems that were completely different and sort of turned on their head hmm. where Christians were sort of expected to be the, the other as they were in the United States. So that was kind of, uh, so your experience in Texas was maybe that the expectation or connection was that Christians should lean more right based on our understanding of yep. American politics. Yep. And in England, it was that Christians were expected culturally to lean more left yep. in their understanding of politics. Yep. That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, did Dave, did your, political formation, your understanding of politics that you inherited, how did that affect you as you became an adult and started to wrestle through these questions on your own? I think positively, knowing that I ought to, as a Christian, be compassionate towards and pray for those who are um, our elected officials, it did help me uh, help mitigate against the um, maybe the angry vitriol. It, it did kind of help me appreciate that there's probably some good in, in what most, if not all, politicians are trying to advocate for. So kind of, uh, I, I think um, this idea that um, uh, the function of government and of part particular leaders that there there is likely some aspect of common grace that they're advocating for. So I um, I don't know. So I, I think how it's impacted me is I'm less. I tend to be less emotionally charged in. Um, in uh, opposition campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just I'm less emotionally charged. I'm, I have more of an inclination to 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 see and appreciate what might be good or useful in in 
events and movements that I might not particularly agree with. Mm. Would you attribute some of that, your ability to kind of separate those and not become so emotionally enmeshed with politics or politicians and a particular viewpoint or agenda? Would you attribute some of that to your grounding religiously, to your understanding first of your security in Christ or in the gospel? Has that affected your ability to remain kind of uh, a little bit, um, what's the word, <laughs> a little bit detached, detached from emotionally from, or are we all just dead inside right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do. I mean, part of it comes from a deep appreciation and grounding in the gospel. I think, um, of my, my identity in the kingdom of God and historically knowing that the church and God's people have, have flourished in all kinds of governmental systems. Um, So, uh, so it, it, yeah, I I suppose it does create a kind of freedom and uh, less anxiety for, uh, that are, that are intertwined in the ups and downs of particular movements. Now, it doesn't mean that I, I don't have some strong feelings towards what kinds of government would function and help produce the flourishing of most people I have all kinds of feelings and thoughts about that. But in terms of my emotional sort of well-being tied with particular movements, I am pretty, uh, I'm, I feel less um, bound by that, by those, those strong emotions. And I think that's because of, because of the gospel. Renee, having seen kind of these different examples within your home of civil disagreement Mm -hmm. over political matters and then living in Texas, as you shared, and then living in England and seeing these different perspectives, what from that collectively have you carried forward that has been really helpful for you as an adult in engaging politics? I think similar to what Dave said, um, knowing the the constantness of the gospel in all environments and the surety of that to to live in a a really republican area and then to live overseas and then to live in Denver I think you see the misplaced hope I think that's been our experience here in Denver with when people have I mean Ultimately, politics is their hope, and legislation is the hope they rely on with nothing undergirding it. And I think to see the gospel of Jesus and and his work in your life flourish in multiple environments, um, it, it makes that louder, and it makes... Politics is important. It is. It's, and I'm... I'm involved, but it, the primacy is still on my relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's where ultimately my hope lies, regardless of who's president, regardless who's on the Supreme court, regardless of who controls Congress. And I think just those different environments helped, helped me see that more clearly. Mm -hmm. You're noticing at a personal level, something that sociologists have noticed at a macro level, which is that as our culture becomes less formally religious and church and worship is less a part of people's lives, that they look for transcendence and meaning and purpose in other things that used to not be religious. And the two that they've noticed the most are politics yep. and, and sexuality or, or romance. You're, you're kind of noticing that among, among friends. Absolutely. Here in Denver, I think, if I, if I didn't have my foundation, the gospel, and my relationship with Jesus, I would be apoplectic observing what's going on around me. And I think I see that in, in a lot of my friends and neighbors where ultimately their ultimate hope and foundation is on political movement or political regime or political policy. And, when, and, it, and I think it, helps, it gives empathy, helps me have empathy to understand the weight of it and, and how, how strongly they feel mm. about issues and people and elections. Um, but I think for me, it's solidified that that's really shifty ground. It's challenged us who are disciples of Christ, too, that if we find ourselves that emotionally 
entangled or yep. enmeshed with our political positions and outcomes, maybe maybe the gospel isn't functioning as powerfully as it could in our in our hearts. Absolutely. We're going to move into some questions that we've received uh, that mm. are connected to this topic within the the topic of politics. So Dave, I would like you to weigh in on this question that we received from one of our listeners. And that question is, should the church provide guidance on political issues? Great. Could you expound on that (laughs) a little bit? As a pastor, (laughs) as a pastor, how would you counsel someone who was asking you this question? Sure. Well, I mean, the responsibility of the church and church leaders is to help make and grow disciples of Jesus. So to be a growing, functional disciple of Jesus, you have to know how to navigate the world in which we're in. And I, politics is a part of part of the world. So you absolutely have to shape and help them know, how do I follow Jesus in this particular sphere of my experience where I live? And we live in a politically charged environment. So yeah, I, you, you need, you need, the church to equip you to, uh, to navigate those waters in a distinctly Jesus oriented way. If the church doesn't do that, then, then you're abdicating and you know, the culture isn't neutral. The broader culture isn't neutral toward it. So they'll just be discipled. They're going to be discipled one way or the other. So you might as well be proactive in discipling you, discipling uh, a, a Christian intentionally with how to navigate politics. However, I think the subtext of this question, I appreciate the way you answer, answered that, but the subtext I think of this question is, should the church provide specific guidance on political issues? So should you, as a pastor, help inform the way someone votes, for instance? Should you guide them towards a particular political candidate? Well, um, I think me as a pastor, I should help equip people with uh, how to think about their voting responsibility. So I, I don't feel comfortable telling someone who to vote for particularly. Um, However, I do feel a responsibility to help a disciple of Jesus know what are the moral and justice-related issues that we are responsible for as people of God that we see in Scripture explicitly, and to exercise uh, one's place in the political sphere in a way that's consistent with that. And, um, and so while, while uh, in, that, in that way, just telling someone who to vote for just subverts the process of discipleship itself. It actually doesn't allow them to go through that growing process, to think through these political issues through the categories we're given by Scripture and ultimately in our obedience to Jesus. One of the things that I know Dave and I have talked a lot about and have a running conversation about, our elders do too, is that our, our, our job as pastors is to uh, teach people the Christian faith, and there are certain places where we have to do what we call binding their conscience, which is to say, here is what a Christian needs to believe or think or embrace uh, in this particular sphere of life or on this particular uh, theological subject because it is endemic to the nature of our faith and the gospel itself. And so this is Christianity. And if, and, and so that's part of our job. And then, but the flip side of that is it's also incumbent upon us not to bind consciences where scripture does not bind consciences. And so for us to say, here's how you have to vote in order to be a faithful Christian, or here's how you have to think about this particular political issue in order to be a faithful Christian. In many cases, that is an overbinding of a conscience where Scripture actually doesn't give us authority to bind consciences. So even in how we're going about this politics vision for life, uh, some of our listeners who are astute might notice, is different than how we went about the sexuality vision for life. 
there has been a consistent Christian sex ethic for 2,000 years, and to live outside of it is to, in a significant way, depart from the faith that was, for once and for all, delivered to the saints. And it also has implications directly tied into the nature of the gospel. So when I'm teaching on sexuality, I'm I'm binding consciences. Mm-hmm. But when I'm teaching on politics, we're doing just what Dave described. We're, we're trying to build a framework and then give people permission or freedom to work out their own convictions with within that framework, which is different than saying, here's what you have to do in order to be a faithful Christian. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. good. So an example may be within both of our major political parties within the United States, uh, they take certain stances on environmental issues. Well, while we would say that the Bible clearly directs us towards being stewards of the creation, that God has clearly uh, given this task to us to cultivate, to take care of the world, uh, creation included, there's not a an exact one-to-one correlation as to how the Bible tells us to think about those environmental issues, that that instead would be a matter of wisdom, discipleship, as you mentioned, Dave, that as we experience this dynamic relationship with the Spirit, that we listen and that it becomes a matter of conscience then, how we vote and are informed in that issue. That's a great example. The Bible uh, tells us that we're stewards of creation. What that means for particular public policy on, say, global warming is a matter of wisdom. Now, if I'm right about this, and, and it means that the way many pastors have approached discipling or leading their church politically is wrong. It, it means that many pastors or sometimes churches or are binding consciences where we ought not to be binding consciences and where Scripture doesn't give us authority, or we're, we're very, in a very heavy-handed way, we're essentially saying no faithful Christian could vote this way mm-hmm. or no faithful Christian could take this issue on a public policy. There might be sometimes some very specific and probably pretty extreme cases where, where that is— that is true. We don't want to eliminate that as a possibility, but as a general rule of thumb, we probably shouldn't be binding consciences a lot on matters of voting and and political Policy. positions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Dave, there's a follow up question here that we also received that alludes, again, calls back to this idea that both you and Renee have mentioned that our ultimate hope is not actually in or through political action, what we can accomplish via politics. Uh, And so this question says, with our citizenship in heaven, is Christian political involvement important or good? Yes. And the reason why it is important is even though our citizenship is in heaven, when you look at how Jesus taught about the kingdom of God, um, whose citizenship um, he gave us access to, that kingdom of God reality um, is manifest on earth. I mean, this is the thing that Jesus wants his disciples to pray your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So to just think of your citizenship in heaven as um, simply something that's far away, therefore it doesn't really matter, um, sort of issues of justice and mercy don't really matter in our world today. Well, that's simply against what Jesus taught us to... uh, how to follow him. It's against, it's against it. So everywhere Jesus went, there were physical and earthly manifestations of the heavenly kingdom reality. So part of being a disciple of Jesus is staking uh, a claim for the, the kingdom of God in some respect. And part this part of what the church is supposed to be about, ultimately, is to represent a heavenly kingdom reality here on earth to represent uh, God's good rule and reign. So uh, all that to say, uh, yes, you should care about it with your citizenship in heaven because you're, you represent 
that heavenly citizenship right here. And how else are people going to understand and appreciate that those that heavenly reality unless they can see it in some real manifest way in your in your life? Hmm. We see in those teachings, Dave, that you just referenced, that we can manifest in our lives, even in the way that we engage in political processes, uh, a sort of gospel renewal to our immediate spheres, to our spheres of influence. And yet there is a limit to what it can accomplish, because we also know that that will that complete restoration will not happen until Jesus returns. And so what should our expectation as Christians be in our political involvement? Great question. The expectation is ultimately just what you said. Our, I mean, our, our hope is fundamentally rooted in Jesus and in his, his return. So that's where our, our hope is rooted in. So, uh, you know, Jesus, on the one hand, he can teach and did teach remarkable uh, sort of uh, ethical um, guidelines for his disciples. People of the kingdom live like this. They expect and they uh, ensure these sort of levels of justice and mercy among, among the community. And on the other hand, he would teach really explicitly that there is going to be a return. It's going to be climactic and final and he is ultimately going to be the, the perfect arbiter of justice. So, um, so as a Christian, in terms of our expectation of involvement in the political world, I think our, our hope is ultimately in Jesus. And by the way, that should make us really humble. should create a kind of humility towards any political activism that we're involved in because it's always going to fall short. And on the other hand, there is a sense of agency and of responsibility that Jesus expects his disciples to, to have and to own, that we um, do our part to representing and showcasing kingdom principles. And I think uh, doing that winsomely in our personal life, when I say personally, I'm just emphasizing the integrity of it so that we do it personally, and then advocating for it publicly as well. Um, but with the sense of persuasion, not coercion. And Dave, as you're saying that, I'm thinking of Jesus' instruction to his disciples that they are the salt of the earth, and uh, the image is that we, pres- we have a preservative effect. Even that maybe gives us what we should expect. Our, our influence is, is more to preserve the common good than it is to completely transform the world into the kingdom of God. We preserve it so Jesus can transform it into the kingdom of God. Right after that, he says, you're the light of the world, so we also draw people to the ultimate king. And for that to be our ambition of having a preservative effect in the world and to draw people to our king, I think are reasonable ambitions. Definitely. Yep. Renee, I'm going to ask you to take this next question, and I'm going to shift this to a bit of a a personal kind of question and example to uh, help us examine how it is that we can do this, how we can engage in the political process as a follower of Jesus and do that while maintaining our hope in the gospel, in Jesus' return, and appropriately placing our expectations in what can be accomplished for the common good through the political process. Mm -hmm. I know from discussions with you outside of this podcast that you do this really well. (laughs) And I've, I've come to you often to ask your opinion about schools, about the school board, about various issues that you follow, about your podcast recommendations. <laughs> and so I want to hear from you, what are some of the issues that you follow in local politics? One of the questions that we received uh, is about this topic. What are big issues in local Denver politics? So in our local and state political level, what mm-hmm. are just some of the issues that you follow that you're interested in and are thinking through? I think right now, um, what motivates my political involvement are things related to the Imago Day. If I can, if I can advocate or become involved in something that helps humans flourish 
in their image of God that, fe- excuse me, that feels like a, um, feels worth my time. So thinking, I mean, I have school age kids, so thinking about education and not just my kids getting a good education, but all kids realizing their God-given imprint and value and to be able to flourish in the environment in which we find ourselves is important to me. So that would be one. Um, I think recognizing people from all over the world and God's image in them and his desires for them. And so if they're here for generations or if they're here recently, regardless of how they got here, that I would love to advocate and work that their potential and their able to flourish in Denver. So um, advocating for immigrants and refugees, that's really important to me, and whatever that looks like locally and even nationally. Um, so I think right now I think that's just where my heart is as far as what's worth my time is when I can help people realize and reflect who God made them to be fully. Mm-hmm. And I think there are a lot of policies, local policies and state and national policies too, that affect that. So that's kind of where I am. Have, has there been, by way of example, has there been any one particular election or issue, policy issue within the last few years in Denver that you really engaged and feel like you you don't have to give us your position, <laughs> but, uh, but a matter that you really engaged and and tried to follow and yeah. landed on a particular position on. I mean, I think regarding education and access and options for quality education for my children and our neighbors and for kids that live in different neighborhoods. And um, I think that would be one that I've followed and have participated in Mm -hmm. and tried to create a scenario where all kids have access to high quality education. And some of those have been ballot measures. Mm -hmm. Funding for education repeatedly comes up in the Colorado ballot. And some of those have been school board elections. Yes. So how did you go about seeking out information about those, those issues? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think I'm trying hard not to. I think there's there are really strong narratives on both sides that almost every issue is filtered through that narrative mm-hmm. and the details are filtered through that narrative. And I think that's really harmful when um, you only interpret the details of a situation through either a really right or really left narrative. It just feels like that's sort of the water we're swimming in right now. Driven by an agenda. Yeah. So to try to really look at the issue and... Um, the, the details of it and how it practically plays out, trying to see it from both sides. Um, so w- your question is, where do, where do you get that information? And I, and I think you have to work really hard and mm-hmm. you have to dig hard and you have to, you have to read the information from both narratives. Mm-hmm. And I think we we'll often will get stuck in just getting information from one side. And I think you need to talk to people from both sides and you need to talk to um, get information from, all from various perspectives on the Mm. issues to kind of get at like what the core of it is. Yeah. Um, I know some of the people you follow do that present information from both sides, I think, and you can both sides as in both a a Republican and democratic Mm -hmm. narrative. Um, but even just party platform statements Mm -hmm. have, I have found to be helpful in reading what the actual, platform yep. and statement is. And then once you have sought out that information, what in your heart and mind mm-hmm. do you, what process do you engage mm-hmm. uh, then? I, th- I think it's, it's a matter of conscience. And I, I mean, I think the Holy Spirit has a role in your own heart. And I, I do think, I think we all have different personalities. We all have different persuasions. And I think all of those are important. And so wherever God has put my heart and my convictions, I mean, I think you pray about it. I think it's super important. I appreciate what Dave said earlier as a child praying for presidents in church. Like, I think that's a really important part of the process. Um, I think I really try to, to ascertain the, the policy or the person or the position that will cause the greatest amount of flourishing for the most amount of people. Mm -hmm. 
And that that speaks to taking a pretty broad approach, yeah. perhaps, rather than a singular approach. For looking sure. at one issue, which can be really difficult right. to wrestle through as a matter of conscience. Yeah. So then once you've landed on a position, how do you then engage people who have gone through a similar process, been informed, mm-hmm. prayed about it, approached this as a matter of conscience, and yet land in a really different place yeah. than you do? I think any of these discussions just need to happen with the backdrop of relationship. I think Twitter and Facebook need to be burned to the ground. <laughs> that is not a position of Fellowship Denver. But <laughs> so we can't we can't discern or glean your your position or your wisdom by just following you on Twitter or Facebook. No, man, I'm going to have to come over for dinner more often. <laughs> then. Um, I think I'm, I was just thinking of this week. I have a small group through the church that is all that are all female, and all four of us are in a very different place politically. And this past Thursday, there was lots of discussion. And because of the, the, because there's a relationship, it's like you, I think we were talking not on the podcast, but before about your dad who had a group of guys that he drank coffee with and they were all over the map, but always left as friends. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have those spaces Conversely, I have a book club that isn't through church. It's just through my neighborhood. And we read a really um, inflammatory book this month. And so the discussion was was heated and represented a variety of positions. But we all left as friends. And I think Mm -hmm. in your spheres, if you can have these conversations in the context of relationship, I think that's the most productive. And and book clubs and Bible studies are political acts. They are people right. getting together totally. to do life together. And then if we create a container where we we love each other and we know each other, that's actually the container for redeemed politics. And I think that's when you, you're able to actually listen and hear and grow. And and I think there, there are positions that I've really kind of had to think through and rethink through mm-hmm. in, the, in those contexts that have Mm -hmm. been really good for me. Mm -hmm. And you just said something really key there. You said think through and rethink through. And Dave mentioned humility in this whole process. I think that that's what a humble posture Mm -hmm. does, listens well and is willing to be reflective and is willing to think and rethink through it again, still holding gospel in its appropriate place and relationship in its appropriate place, not allowing a different opinion to unseat those matters and those important those more important (laughs) matters. Um, Hunter, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on this last question that we received. Does it seem that every choice within electoral and governmental politics is a compromise? And how should Christians navigate that? It is a compromise. Our system is set up for that to be the case. And we even agreed in the founding of America, we, we, we weren't there to agree, but it was agreed for us. <laughs> we, we, we agreed that we're going to uh, govern our common life together by this Constitution and these, this Bill of Rights and, and these principles that are, that are founded in the Constitution. And that is our common ground, not necessarily our particular position on different things. And so I, I think the system that we're set up in uh, means that you need to have some level of tolerance for compromise. And it's why I mentioned earlier the salt metaphor that Jesus shared with his disciples. I, if, if we have that our goal is to transform this broken world into the perfect righteous and ju- righteousness and justice of God— we're going to be disappointed every time, and we're going to be unable to compromise because, because we can't compromise or we failed at our mission. On the other hand, if our mission is simply to slow the spread of evil and to create a, a, a container for good work to flourish, and, and that's a pretty chastened expectation. It's, it's not a grandiose vision. It's a, it's, it's a, pretty unglamorous vision like we're just we're just trying to keep the kids alive until dad gets home you know that's that's really what we're saying if if that's our ambition then I do think it allows some room for compromise it it lets us say 
this particular piece of legislation, let's say, or this particular policy is not perfect. It's not ideal, but it is going to be better than nothing, or it's going to be better than the alternative, and it's going to preserve some level of of civility and, and common decency so that life can flourish. And if, if that's our ambition, then I, I think that we are in a more reasonable place, and then we, we can compromise. Hmm. I heard uh, uh, some advice from a leader of another a political institution, a political activist institution, on a, a different a class broadcast that I was listening to last week that I found to be very helpful for me in thinking through that issue. I, I've heard many friends and family members processing, well, this the exact place that we find ourselves as we head into this political season, which we're addressing in the politics class. What do I do when I don't really align with either of our major political parties? How do I decide? How do I decide what to do, how to vote, what policy to support? His advice was to wrestle through it as a matter of conscience with Jesus and then to continue being politically active. So if you find yourself leaning towards voting for a Republican ticket in the fall, but you find some things lacking, then continue being politically active and advocate for those things and live in line with the values that you have landed on with the Holy Spirit. If you find yourself leaning to the left, but finding that ticket also wanting, then vote with your conscience and continue being politically active and advocating for the areas of weakness that you see inherent in that ideology. And I found that to be very helpful, that it doesn't have to be, we're, we're making a black and white choice full stop. So it is a compromise, and yet we can continue working past that moment in time. Essentially, what you're saying is that politics is bigger than voting. And we talked about this in our first class when we framed it up. We said there's all kinds of political activity from the public square that we all participate in to governmental politics, governing to electoral politics, which is where we make decisions about who we're going to vote for, to um, just persuasive politics, which is just having conversations with people. So what you're helping us see, which I really appreciate, is that you can make a decision on how you're going to vote on a particular issue or a particular ballot initiative or or in a particular election. You can make a decision about how you're going to vote based on wisdom, knowing that it's not the perfect ideal. We, we don't even expect that to exist. And then you have more political responsibility and agency than just this vote. You can also be involved in advocating for things that are going to affect government. You can you can have book clubs with your neighbors from mm-hmm. all different political persuasions where, where you guys are talking civilly about things. That's an excellent political act. There's all kinds of political activity you can do beyond just deciding who to vote for. Mm. Well, Dave, Renee, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. It was fun. Loved it. We'll wrap it up there continue listening for a couple more weeks of the Vision for Life class. If you have questions or comments that you would like to send us so that we can address those questions in future podcast episodes, you can send those in to podcast at fellowshipdenver.org or via text by texting podcast to 94000. And we're inviting Dave back to address all the hardest questions you submit. So (laughs) great to submit hard questions. Bring them on. (laughs) Love it.